A warm welcome to all our viewers to our series Natural Medicine. I was allowed to prepare a special today because I have a surgeon here, a foot surgeon, and he is from Zurich. It's Dr. Urs Graf, whom I'd like to warmly welcome. Hello, dear Urs. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. We've hardly talked about feet here in the studio. And that's why it's a great pleasure for me today to be allowed to produce a few programs with you. And I'd like to start with the Pes Equinus Flatfoot Foot Drop. I found all these names. I think the Foot Drop is the Clubfoot or vice versa. No, no, uh, Clubfoot is the Pes Equinus. OK, and what does it look like or where's the problem? This is often already present at birth. The small children have such inward pointing feet, which are also often deformed. And they're also so called hollow feet, that is, the longitudinal arch is far too pronounced. So you couldn't put your foot down normally if it was allowed to grow out in this position. Ah, then there are the special splints that you make for the babies. Yeah, that's more for the hips. Hips, yeah. But for the foot, as far as I know, there is still no conservative therapy to correct this deformity. And what do you do then? Operate? Yeah. Oh, is that common? Phew, uh, I'm bad at numbers on this one. Uh, did you have to do a lot of surgeries in this regard? Uh, that is the specialty of paediatric surgeons. But at the centres, this is a frequent operation. OK, I'm actually sad, but you have to do it as a baby and you can't just sit it out and then somehow do it at a later age. The set later then becomes tedious because you'd need special shoes anyway, which can't always be avoided with a, even with an operation. But the results nowadays are actually quite good and the sooner you correct that, the sooner that the young body can adapt. It's all still changing in growth. If you compare a child's foot with an adult's foot, they're so squishy. Yeah, yeah, they are really cute. Cute to look at, but the little ones could not stand on them if they wanted and could from the rest of the functions. It would be too early because the foot is not yet so resilient at this age. We are born completely underdeveloped. For many people, it also stays that way. <laughs> Good one. Of course, we'll cut that out again. But no, it will, it will be broadcast uncensored. But I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> well, so that's operated on, and that's the club foot, the Pesaquinus. And what is the foot drop? Foot drop is not congenital. It's common, yeah, and it, it can be... Sorry, I've seen those that are innate, but... That's a shortening of the Achilles tendon and the calf muscles. And that, of course, leads to that people put too much strain on the forefoot and that causes problems. The most harmless form is splayfoot. We all develop that at some point as we get older. What is a splayfoot? When the transverse arch diverges at the front, so like a fan. Oh, does that also have something to do with the weight, that you want to spread it wider? Uh, partly, yeah, but if you look at primitive peoples who walk barefoot all their lives, they all kind of develop paws like that over time. Well, sorry, but then it just doesn't look like a Central European foot anymore, just as we're used to, because our feet are constantly in our shoes. That's why we don't have really pronounced splay feet. You may notice that you always need bigger or wider shoes with increasing age. I've heard more about hallocks, of course, that you need special shoes or wider shoes if something develops that. Well, the risk of hallux valgus is, of course, greater with a splayfoot in a shoe. But that would be a topic in itself. Of course, we'll also do our own show about it. And, uh, of course, what happens with splayfoot or overload is when the heels are also incredibly high. One can well imagine in this position, the weight distribution is reasonably homogenous, but here it isn't. 
Yeah, and then it spreads at the front. Yeah, easy. There's a nice comparison picture on the internet. A uh, foot with a load, so with high heels and then without. And if you compare that without it, the skeleton is perfectly normal. And if you take the x-ray in the high heel shoe, it looks like a deformed hallux foot. So, it does favour the hallux development. But I also think the whole musculoskeletal system is somehow, of course, it's non-physiological. It just looks very elegant. Yeah, very nice. I like to see it too. But I always say, how can you walk with it? And if you keep doing that, what happens then? Yeah, then you will get foot drop because over time everything shortens. Back at the ankle and the whole calf muscles. In part, this can be expanded again because women often give up on high heels in old age, or, well, yes, in old age, because they think it is no longer appropriate and would then like to put on flat shoes and then it just doesn't go so well anymore because that's exactly when it starts to hurt because the tension is so great. By forcibly pushing the foot back to the right angle or further. And then where is the pain? Either in the calves or in the whole forefoot area with bones. There's the typical forefoot pain under the base joints of the toes. That's also something typical. And that can be operated on. That's a pretty nasty subject at times. That when the whole thing is within a tolerable range, you can operate on it, but then you don't operate on the foot, but rather, well, I did it at the top of each knee. An extension, or, yeah, it comes down to that. So the principle is like this. You can imagine the muscle with the muscle sheath. The muscle is flexible, the sheath is not. It's like the Sunday roast, the white layer on top. And when you pull it, it goes as far as the sheath is long. Then it's done. If this has become established over the years, then the muscle simply can no longer be stretched, although the potential would be there if it wasn't prevented from doing so by this layer of fibres, so the muscle sheath, which then ultimately merges into the Achilles tendon. And if you just incise the shell, the muscles separate. Lo and behold, the tension is gone or significantly reduced. And this is an operation that is arguably the most satisfying, both for the patient and for the surgeon, because the worst that can happen is that it is of no use, but that's very rare. And the key experience uh, for me, was uh, an acquaintance of mine who suffers from exactly that and nothing else. I did the operation for her and already joined the visit in the room three hours after the operation. She said, the pain is gone. All was good. Cool, great. And that's the, that's the minimal intervention, if you will. But you have to know first, where does it come from? Yeah, exactly. Now we have the third one, the foot drop. What, what is that? Uh, it's foot drop, that's what I've just said. Uh, so we have club foot, foot drop, pezzaquinus, do I have... Oh, flat foot, flat, flat, flat foot. Exactly, that, that's also an issue. That hits more or less everyone, sometimes more, sometimes less, but most people don't suffer from it, they just use insults. And then, that's good, but it's actually not the right solution. Well, I only ever know a flat foot is when this arching, exactly, the longitudinal arch is flat, just flat. And what is the problem? Yeah, you don't strain the foot correctly. You have to look at the axis in the foot, which runs more or less vertically. So, that means the support point is under the main weight. And with flat feet, it's often the case that the foot moves outwards. And then the load comes next to the foot. So, you literally walk next to your shoes at the end. And then there are problems because that can no longer be corrected with any splints or insoles. Then you have to operate. 
and the results are not always so convincing because firstly there are often ligaments that are no longer good and, and that's basically the cause and then the bone shift uh, then there's arthrosis because the stress is then no longer what it was supposed to be and then you have to try to correct it and and that's often only possible with stiffening. And any stiffening is, of course, somewhat problematic because the failure rate is relatively high. That it doesn't last. And the wall pattern is, of course, also changed, which is often then corrected again with roll-off ramps and other insoles. <coughs> is flat foot common these days? Or is that due to weight? I keep he hearing overweight people have more flat feet. Is that correct? Yeah, it's true, because the load is, of course, or maybe the foot is... Nah, well, I have to go back further. We're not made to live for 80 years. The feet? No, we as humans. I sometimes hear the opposite. We were created for 120 years. No, I don't think so. Um, you'd have to be able to stop the ageing process. I mean, when I went to school, parents died at 70. Yeah, earlier, yeah. And even then, that was a step forward compared to the turn of the century. And the older you get, the longer the strain acts on the joints. And they're not up to it. Of course, there are lucky people who can still run marathons at 90, but those are the big exceptions. Well, Professor Hecht, Karl Hecht from Berlin, he once told me in an interview that he's 97, he really walks 10 kilometers every day. And he just says, movement, movement, movement is everything. Now, I'm completely in agreement with that. But if at some point it no longer works because the arthrosis, for example, the arthrosis is so advanced, you get into a vicious circle. But where is the arthrosis supposed to come from? If I somehow keep my diet good, actually do everything well and properly and walk those 10,000 steps or 10 kilometers every day, does arthrosis have to develop then? Not really, right? Um... I can perhaps explain it myself or try to explain it. In my whole life, I walked a lot in the military and I still have arthrosis. And arthrosis can develop so suddenly that you need a hip prosthesis within six months. Like me, for example. In June, I was still walking the dog in the woods, and then boom, and in August, I was on stakes. Uh, for example, I'm just wondering what's causing it to go so fast. I always believe in a cause that has an effect and not the effect. I guess when I saw my femoral head, that it just kind of died off, and why? No one can say. I live healthy and exercise too, exercise a lot. And in contrast to the health apostles, I am of the opinion, for example, jogging on tarmac isn't necessarily good for health, least of all for the joints. The cardiologists will have a different opinion, that, that's logical. Because the heart and the circulatory system are kept on the go, that sure is good, but the joints... You have to imagine, when you land, you have up to eight times your body weight. Up to eight times! So if I were to go jogging with my almost 100 kilograms, we get to almost 800 kilograms. At the moment of impact, you certainly have eight times your body weight. Crazy! I have daughters who did figure skating, until they got knee problems somehow. It was always clear to me that with these blows when they come down on such small skids, that's terrible, it can't be healthy. Yeah, although that is then distributed over the entire foot in the shoe. But the blow is still there, eightfold, isn't it? And then maybe on the skid, that might be even more. Yeah, I mean, when you've seen ballerinas, or rather their feet, oh, those feet aren't pretty either. No, no, I've seen that too. I did a little more research to tell you something else about feet. 
Statistically, we all walk 10,000 steps a day. I may be the exception, I sit more. Our feet carry us 160,000 kilometres in a lifetime. That's a lot. I think it's 42,000 kilometres around the world, so we get around the world about four times. Yeah, the computer nerds, maybe not anymore or only virtually. Uh, but normally, yes, and you have to be aware, just we don't walk much compared to, for example, our parents. So, we walk more than our parents. No, uh, perhaps somewhat trivial example, if you look at how the children are carted to school. We walk to school. We were even forbidden to use the bike if you didn't live at least a kilometre away. Yeah, me too. I was short of 200 metres. <laughs> but that's why the pedometer is in fashion now. People now use pedometers. And where's the fun? No, not at all, but I usually have my cell phone with me and I have one on there too, so then I look at my obligatory Sunday walk to see if we've reached our 10,000 steps. Yeah, and here we are again on the topic of arthrosis and all that. It, it, it is smarter to walk a lot and take the risk. And I think it's also genetically determined whether you get arthrosis or not. I have another amazing story. There are more sensory cells in our feet than in our face. Feet provide support, balance and mobility and are masterpieces of evolution. Our feet are constructed in an impressively complex way, almost 30 bones, almost 30 joints, 60 muscles, more than 100 ligaments and innumerable tendons and nerves make them an, an ingenious masterpiece. So you as a surgeon really have to be an artist in... In this gear, a foot is probably like a Swiss clockwork to do the right thing here so that everything works again. Yeah, that's why I'm always thinking twice about whether I should really operate or not. Well, nowadays it's said again and again in orthopedics too. Operations are performed much too quickly. Are we much more careful with your feet? Or is that you? I think so, but it's like this. There are simply deformities like hallux, vulgus, which we'll come back to later. There's simply nothing else to do when people suffer from it. But otherwise, yeah, every cut destroys, of course, nerve cells, for example, or nerve tracts. This is unavoidable. Often it doesn't matter, you get used to it well. Sometimes you don't even feel it anymore. But on the other hand, we try to make something that is deformed right again. The problem is that patients often come very late, maybe not so in our region. But for example, I operated in Samaritz for a, a relatively long time. And there, the people really wait until there is no other way. They think they're strong and only come at the last moment. And then there's nothing else to do but try to somehow restore it to the way it used to be. The Zurica comes sooner. <laughs> yeah, rather. I have one more question. My father was an orthopedist and, as children, he always made sure that we were walking straight. Because so many people walk this way or that way these days. He always said it's important that the child's bones are nicely aligned, that you're walking straight. And then we always got such special shoes, a low shoe that looks like a hiking shoe, and so we really had to learn to walk straight. Today we're also walking straight, but when I look at people today like this on the back of the heel, the way they walk so diagonally on all sides with these sneakers. Yeah, exactly. What actually happens to these feet when they've been doing this for 20, 30 years? If everything else is correct, probably not very much. OK, my father made a huge fuss and I had to enjoy, endure 20 years of suffering with these stupid shoes. But maybe you are not suffering now.
Maybe you would. Okay. It's difficult to say. OK, but what happens if you keep rolling like that? Yeah, well, of course. After all, medicine is statistics. So what is normal is based on what most people have. Feel, exhibit, or even the shape of their feet. And... As I said, we don't actually have naturally formed feet because we're in shoes all the time. And of course, there are other problems associated with this, such as Pallax valgus. Indigenous people rarely have Pallax valgus. The feet just get wider, but they don't suffer either. This is the natural progression. I can see that we also have to deal with this Hallux issue. It always comes back. And I mean... Your father, I also agree with trying to develop everything as physiological as possible, early on with the right shoes. And I mean, the feet, oh, there's a famous saying, you just don't notice them until they hurt, because firstly, firstly they are furthest away from the brain, and secondly, always in the dark, in shoes. Yeah. I'd, like, I'd still like to go deeper in the operations, and it's always about that after an operation, a very fast wound healing takes place, a regeneration takes place. And I heard from you that you work here with techniques that accelerate wound healing and regeneration. Can you tell me anything else about that? Well, I started with permanent magnets, strong permanent magnets. That was good. The only problem was I'm not an accountant. That's why. I always kind of lost these magnets or something. <laughs> it ended up being a, a losing proposition for me. The patients have benefited. And when I see wound healing disorders, severe swelling that could lead to problems, then I use the pulsing red light, for example. That's a really good thing. I heard a lot from the University in Vienna that studies have been done about it. Unfortunately, far too little is known in this country. In Austria, basically every physiotherapist has this. I've now heard that health insurance companies in Austria even pay for the purchase of such a device if it's medically prescribed. Really? Yeah, they, they are way ahead. Yeah, it seems so, because if I send requests to health insurances, I always get the same answer. This is not on the my gel list, so the list of resources and devices. I don't understand, but the cantonal hospitals and St. Gallen have it and work with it. Then they probably pay for it themselves, or account for it in some other way, but it's not possible as a private surgeon. We wish the patients every success, and we are happy that they're doing well, but we don't pay for it. That's the answer. But is such a technology in this area suitable for accelerating the healing process so quickly that it really pays off? Yeah, I'm convinced. And I'll tell you why. Of course, I don't have a study, I can't back it up like that. But when I see the feet, how quickly the swelling reduces if they are swollen, which should be avoided anyway. I have to say, it has to have an effect. I've also tried it myself. I always do that with such techniques. And I'm convinced. After my hip surgery, I've always had this pain from the capsule suture. It was a bit swollen. I started with this pulsating red light, and lo and behold, in two days, the pain was gone. This isn't a commercial, it is a fact. We're not talking about infrared here, which generates heat. We're talking about pulsating red light. Exactly, long wave red monochromatic light with LEDs, with high intensity. If you hold this on your hand, your whole hand or foot will glow. I sometimes tease the neighbors and shine it over there. <laughs> It is really bright. Yeah, I have a colleague who is a specialist in wound care for problem wounds. I introduced it to him once and he laughed at me at first. Red light belongs to Hamburg, St. Pauli. Yeah, of course, or in the esoteric corner. Exactly, and then I said, well, I have a patient with foot problems, a diabetic with a real hole in his heel, at the bottom. An attempt was made, a designated wound specialists tried to close this wound for a year. Uh, nothing happened. 
At that time, I didn't give the device home, but the, the patient came twice a week and did the treatment. And in two months, the hole was closed and stayed closed, and I didn't do anything else. And that really convinced me. Wound healing and regeneration, or even minor injuries, when you fall on your knees or inflammation. How about teeth? Would you also use it there for inflammation? I wouldn't be worried at all, because the biggest side effect is that it doesn't work. So it's completely unproblematic. You just don't have to shine it in the eyes, but that's it. It's a medically approved device, I know, that's the only one in the red light area that has medical approval. But it is freely available in this regard. But the effect is proven that it really does work. A lot of studies have been done about it. It definitely doesn't belong in the esoteric category because... Exactly, these, these studies exist. And maybe that's why it's not that popular. Especially not with surgical doctors, because the whole thing is relatively unspectacular. And today, you want always something spectacular. You see it and hear it every day. And you know what it probably is, that without any side effects, as you nicely said. And of course, that's a good thing on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, not. Doctors work with drugs, right, in the end? Because that's how they learned, which is good too, isn't it? Yeah, but what do you do when you don't have drugs available that can cure this issue? I mean, going back to the foot, my mum has bad feet because she always refused to have surgery. And she had an open hammer toe from the friction of the shoe. And the bone was visible. And I said, that's pain. I don't really see any other solution than either you amputate the toe, because I don't have anything to close it, the skin, the skin is simply missing. Or maybe you try it for a month or two months with the repulse, so this device. So she said amputation is out of the question, I'd rather do that. And? Closed. Kudos. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Dearest, you stay here, we'll talk about Hallux, as promised. Many thanks for the first explanations about our feet. Dear viewers, our feet leave traces all our lives for 160,000 kilometers. And it's really important that we pay a bit more attention to them. Say thank you, or even give them good shoes where you walk well in them, and as we've also heard, these high heels are always to be looked at a little bit critically. So don't keep wearing them all the time, but every now and then it's okay. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. See you next time.